I glanced back up at the castle ahead of me, already aware of what was waiting for me there. I began to gallop again, holding my invisible reins as I pretended to ride forward. Once again, Patsy began to bang his coconut halves together, galloping along behind me. When we reached the entrance of the castle, I pulled back on my reins and brought my steed to a halt. Whoa there, I shouted. My score increased by 100 points, bringing it back up to zero. On cue, two soldiers appeared up above, leaning over the castle wall. Who goes there? One of them shouted down at us. It is I, Arthur, son of Uther Pendragon, from the castle of Camelot, I recited. King of the Britons, defeater of the Saxons, sovereign of all England. My score jumped up another 500 points, and a message informed me that I'd received a bonus for my accent and inflection. In my ear, I could hear my friends giggling and applauding. That's like the least funny part of the entire movie. Is that all they got permission to use? I know, there's like no, jo there's no jokes in there. Oh, <laughs> uh, there's no jokes anywhere. Hello and welcome to another episode of the St. Ballastar University English Club Podcast. I'm Joshua. And I'm Wade Watts. Oh, wow. Okay, this is a surprise. I didn't realize we were going to have a, a celebrity in the studio today. Yeah, you know me. I heard there was going to be pop culture references, and that's kind of my thing. It's actually my entire personality and everything I have going on in my life. Oh, that's crazy. Um, I'm actually sort of a pop culture fan myself. As I glance around my, I mean, the uh, English club room, <laughs> uh, I see <laughs> at least two separate Fire Emblem posters and two city pop albums framed on the wall those are from the 80s you like the 80s right only the american 80s and only a very specific reagan era of the 1980s okay so we're sort of cherry picking the flavor of 80s that we like yeah you know uh, perhaps the kind of 80s that an old sad man child would like and want to write a book about to reclaim his lost youth well an old sad man child <laughs> you don't say you know, Wade, this is a heck of a coincidence, because today we're actually uh, slated to talk about Ernest Cline's Ready Player One, the second New York Times bestseller we've had on the English Club. But probably a more longer-running uh, entry in that list. Listen, the difference between a doctor that graduates at the top of his class and the doctor that graduates from the bottom of his class is nothing. They're both doctors at the end of the day, all right? <laughs> both these books get to say... <laughs> They're a New York Times bestseller on the top of the front cover, and that's just how it is. They get to pump me full of whatever they want, you know, that's their God-given right. That is, <laughs> that is their divine right of doctors, as they said in the Middle Ages. <laughs> um, right. So, um, today is another special episode, kind of like how we did Gothicana, but the roles are switched. If you remember our Gothicana episode, I had read the latter half and Joshua had read the former half. But today, I have only read the first half of Ernest Cline's Ready Player One. I, I, you're just going to have to take it on faith that I have no idea what happens after what I've read in Ready Player One. I haven't seen the movie. I have seen a trailer I might have watched the Red Letter Media episode about it. There's one thing I know from the second half, and I'll talk about it in my predictions, that got spoiled for me because of my fiancé. But everything else, I'm completely blind, and we're going to try to meet in the middle and piece together the story of Ready Player One. Um, if anybody's curious about how we split these books in half, uh, we just sort of did it visually by, like, page look. So coincidentally, um, I read starting exactly at the beginning of chapter 19 until the end, uh, which also really weirdly like functioned well as a self-contained story. A lot of exposition is missing, but like it creates a really compelling starting point. It feels very much like you've been dropped into the into the middle of the action. You know why it's missing from your half? Why? Because it was all in mine. I felt so bad for you because I thought you would be completely lost because half of my half, so a quarter of the book, was backstory and exposition. And the action proper didn't start until, you know, a quarter of the way through. I thought you would be completely lost. I was actually really worried as I was reading it, and increasingly so as I got towards the end, that the first half was going to turn out to be just exposition. Because it really does feel like the actual conflict of the story begins at chapter 19. <laughs> I mean, just based on where the story is at when I started reading, I was wondering what, what of note, except for one in particular thing, could possibly have happened up until that point. There were a lot of um, like proper nouns of future tech that I didn't really understand, but like 
none of them ever ended up being actually plot relevant. So anything I was missing was just flavor. So with that in mind, I think the best way for us to move forward is I will dump all of my exposition onto you so that we can continue forward into a new era of complete understanding of Ready Player One. Yeah, let's hit it. Okay, so again, I'm going to read the back of the book, and this I also haven't read this. This time it was just out of laziness. I didn't do it on purpose, but here we go. In the year 2044, reality is an ugly place. The only time teenage Wade Watts really feels alive is when he's jacked in to the virtual utopia known as the Oasis. Wade's devoted his life to studying the puzzles hidden within this world's digital confines. Puzzles that are based on their creator's obsession with the pop culture of decades past, and that promise massive power and fortune to whomever can unlock them. But when Wade stumbles upon the first clue, he finds himself beset by players willing to kill to take this ultimate prize. The race is on, and if Wade's going to survive, he'll have to win and confront the real world he's always been so desperate to escape. Okay, sounds potentially interesting. Um, doesn't doesn't really sound like the book I read, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> That's so funny. So it is the near future. Um, near future is in 2044. And as we kind of talked about, so Wade kind of lives in this really interesting, like, trailer park stack you know they take trailers and they build them vertically which they do in real life in certain places it's kind of it's kind of neat to see um he lives with his abusive aunt and uncle and he got this like scholarship to a fully vr oasis school that he goes to where everyone is like this cartoon avatar and they keep their identities secret and everything's kind of like a video game because the entire world as we know it has been influenced by this man named Halliday, who was the one who created the Oasis. It's like VR chat, but that's everyone's entire life, and it's what Wade spends most of his time doing. So Halliday, when he died, he set up to where his inheritance would go to whoever found the Easter egg, which is hidden behind three gates and if you can emulate his life in a very specific way and learn enough 80s pop culture references you can win this billions of dollars and escape from this you know dystopian sort of apocalyptic world i have so many questions about this world these questions are not necessarily like totally important to understanding like the plot but they are sort of like important scene setting stuff that i was missing so the company that owns the oasis if they keep getting abbreviated in the second half is like ioi so that is a different so there is another company called ioi and they i don't know what it stands for but they are trying to win the easter egg in like a corporate way they want to take over oasis and monetize it and commercialize it and turn it into the internet as we know it today which I, i'll get to later on it was so it was just halliday right and like his other business partners yeah ogden ogden shows up at the end of the second half um for he's literally not a character so don't worry about he it. he shows up at the end of the first half too that's really funny and i guess okay, never in but, between so the evil company ioi that their goal was slightly confusing to me but like it also felt like it didn't really matter that much because like they're an evil corporation and they want to be evil and they want to kill the good guys so it's like i didn't really care that much but the novel also makes it really hard to care because sorrento who i think is the ceo of 
IOI. The guy. Yeah, he's the man. He's like not in the second half. He's not? Is he in the first half? Joshua, you just ruined my entire prediction. Whatever. I'm still going to make my prediction. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. Sorrento was the key to my every prediction. That's so annoying. Um, so yeah, he's like, he is kind of the director or CEO or whatever. And they're called Sixers because their usernames all start with six for some reason. Um, but they're called Suxers by the Egg Hunters, who are the independent agents looking for the egg. So Wade, his his username is Parzival, and he has this friend named H, who's like a higher level gunter, they call them, than him. And they kind of hang out in their little virtual basement and talk about pop culture references and at some point we learn that there's this other gunter she's just a blogger named artemis and just from reading her blog posts wade knows that this is the most beautiful amazing woman in the whole world yeah her uh physical beauty will become relevant <laughs> unfortunately Oh, yeah. No, her physical beauty is like the whole thing, because this is the kind of um, level that we're working on here. Uh, Anyways, so Wade realizes through this epiphany that the first key to one of the three gates that will eventually lead him to the egg is on the virtual world that he's been in school at. And... This results in him having to navigate a dungeon from Dungeons and Dragons and then play an arcade game with a lich. Cool. That sounds really fun to describe in a book. Oh, oh, it's so fun to describe in a book because of all the proper nouns of real life things that existed in the 80s that we had to get through to get to this point. He meets up with Artemis in real life and her avatar is so pretty and amazing and... They they kind of have this rivalry because, of course, they're fighting for the one Easter egg, so they can't really get close to each other, but you can tell there's this illicit attraction because she looks like an 80s character that he recognizes. She has no beauty on her own. It's just because it's like this property that he's a fan of. He wins the first key but it's almost too late because the Sixers are there and they set up a farm so that they can farm keys and give it to all the other Suxers. But still, Wade gets the credit for being the first one to get the... the, It was a key that wasn't jade and it wasn't crystal. I don't remember what color key it was. I don't know if they even mention it again in the second half. (laughs) They might not. But this leads to a lot of real life and virtual fame for Wade so he can kind of like pay for his own living expenses because he's famous and everyone wants to interview him and he has like all these like corporate sponsors that kind of give him some money um but eventually ioi finds out who he is and he gets this interview opportunity and he that's where he kind of meets sorrento and sorrento's like join me luke and Wade's like, no, he like has this this quote unquote badass moment where he tells off Sorrento and says he'll never be corrupted. And then it's revealed that IOI knows his real life identity and stages this this uh, what looks to be a meth lab incident that blows up the trailer park that he left in, killing his abusive aunt and uncle. And I'm I'm so sure, I'm so positive, I don't know for sure, but I, I'm, I know it in my heart of hearts that this horrible tragedy is directly compared to Star Wars A New Hope. Um, so now bereft and fully orphaned, Wade goes to Ohio where he lives in this like ramshackle hotel and dedicates himself to the, the egg hunt. He works to find the next step of the process or whatever i don't even know and kind of starts this will they won't they romance with artemis this is what i'm interested in because when when chapter 19 starts they have just broken up and it has decimated wade's life so i would love to hear about like why they broke up i actually kind of enjoyed not knowing because i get the sense that it literally doesn't matter Uh, But, you know, for the sake of summary. You got it, buddy. That's it. 
It doesn't matter. He, uh, let's see. They're trying to find, like, the next part of it, and then he has to, like, act out line for line the movie War Games, which used to be one of my favorite movies, but now that's ruined. Did they, wait, 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 I have to know. Uh, was, was there several pages dedicated to just writing out in ink the script of the movie War Games? To his credit, no, there wasn't, but the, it got close. Okay, cool. I guess they saved that bit for later with a different movie. Oh, did they do <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you all about it. I'll let you guess what movie it is when we get there when I hear your predictions. So we're getting to what you were talking about. Ogden, who is like the the Wozniak to to Halliday's Steve Jobs, is still alive and invites Wade and Artemis to his his virtual house for a party. Of course, it's all 80s music and they do 80s dances and it's so awful. But the reason it doesn't matter is because Wade's just being a simp at this point. He's like, um, he's like, I don't care about the egg hunt. I I just want you. And Artemis has been talking about how she would use the egg hunt money to like make the world a better place and worry about the real world. And he's like, throw all of that away because I think your avatar is attractive and we like the same 80s movies. And she's like no i'm not into it and literally flies away or something and then the sixers attack wozniak's house and there's a little fight scene and that is the end of my knowledge of ready player one it was artemis she wore a suit of scaled gunmetal blue armor that looked more sci-fi than fantasy twin blaster pistols were slung low on her hips in quick-draw holsters, and there was a long, curved, elvish sword in a scabbard across her back, and a pair of classic Ray-Ban shades. Overall, she seemed to be going for a sort of mid-80s, post-apocalyptic, cyberpunk, girl-next-door look, and it was working for me, in a big way. In a word, hot. (laughs) (laughs) Zooey mama. Okay, so before we get into your predictions, which I'm so, so excited to hear, there's a few things that I would love to know about because they tie into my critiques for later later in the, the club meeting. So I would love to know, is, is Halliday's like, incredible narcissism ever acknowledged explicitly? Because to me, it is so bizarre that in order to get the Easter egg and win the game, which by the way, that's not what an Easter egg is. If it's the thing you need to win the game, it's just called an objective. Um, <laughs> but if if that's the thing that you need is is no, intimate knowledge of every moment of this man's life and all of his hobbies and all of his interests, like the fact that he set up the world to remember him forever in this way, like is that ever talked about or is it just taken for granted? Never directly acknowledged. Of course, the the reader is invited to make their own conclusions because you're literally in like a model of Halliday's childhood home playing on his childhood computer to to win the game. But no, we we live in a world completely defined by effectively Steve Jobs. Uh, and that's uncritically accepted. Okay. Maybe subtextually you can argue that we should probably be questioning this, but I've never been given any reason from Wade, even Artemis who like, is kind of a bleeding heart, save the world type. Nothing is like, hey, isn't it kind of weird that we're hanging out in his childhood home? Okay, because he shows up kind of in the second half for a moment. Uh And I don't think the novel wants us to question his, I don't know, messiah complex or whatever it is. Because the way he's presented is, I mean, it it is Christ-like. But we can get to that later. The other thing I wanted to know is, so in the second half, there's, maybe not a single time that a normal person talks like everybody who talks is intimately involved in the world of the oasis uh we don't really get the perspectives of like normal people who are presumably suffering under the the boot of ioi um so in the first half like do we know anything about how other people feel about the constant 80s references or does just everybody in the world love I don't know, Rush and U2 or whatever. 
you will be so glad to hear, Joshua, that there is wonderful, amazing things in this world outside of 80s pop culture. Wade's own mother was a drug addict and I do believe a prostitute who died of an overdose. And there was an old lady who offered him soy sausages, soy bacon in the beginning, and she died horribly in an explosion. So those are your two options if you're not going to be obsessed with virtual reality and 80s pop culture. Okay, so you can be a drug addict that dies, or you can be like soy pilled. (laughs) Yes, those are your two options. Exactly. Cool. Huh, interesting. I wonder if that's indicative of anything about, I don't know, Ernest Klein's inner world. <laughs> I don't know, Joshua. Maybe that's not our place to speculate about, but like some of the things that happen in the second half just really feel revealing in a way that's similar to Gothicana, except I feel like in Gothicana, it was like, it's it's openly a sex book. So like the fact that these are the author's fantasies, are it's not really like a surprise. Right. It's just like sometimes... Sometimes it seems like maybe the author isn't aware of how those fantasies will be received. Whereas in this, it's like, I don't know if Ernest Klein realizes how revealing some of this stuff could be read as being. Not saying it actually is. However, based on some of his poetry, which I hope we'll get to talk about, there's there's maybe something there. Yes, uh, I think given his poetry career, we can conclude pretty safely that he was either entirely unaware of how revealing this was or in true Halliday fashion wanted us to revel in it. It feels very, very empty to me. It feels like licking Ronald Reagan's boot with every sentence I read. It, it, it made me deeply, deeply uncomfortable to read. I mentioned Artemis's descriptions and I think even, I want to say Halliday's wife, maybe Ogden, one of like the big Oasis people, his wife changed her name to something that referenced the dark crystal Lord. and was only beautiful in a way that invoked an 80s character. And I get call me a bleeding heart feminist, but something in me broke when I read that. And I, I, I just got so upset that like, even if you were like, oh, she was so hot, that would be better than, oh, she looked like the elf from Dark Crystal, which made her so beautiful. Like, it, it's so wrong. Yeah, it's really sad that there's this world of infinite possibility in the Oasis, and all it's used for is to just recreate things that already exist or existed and have faded from relevance. Like, there's this potential for... I mean, anything, really anything, can be created for virtually free... And instead, all people do is go into it and play Pac-Man on virtual arcade cabinets, which is like, what? but why? It doesn't make sense. It's, it really, truly defies reason. Um, and we, we, I, I do want to talk about the way that video games work in this video game. But first, but first, let's hear about your predictions uh, involving Sorrento specifically, <laughs> because I, I want to know what role Sorrento played in the better version of the second half of this book that you certainly wrote. Oh, Joshua, 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 do I have the story for you? I, I, I want this to be real. This is the most amazing story in my head. I really, I really want to be right about this. So to set the stage, uh, just to recap, we're starting right at the end of chapter, I guess, 18, um, the party has just ended. Artemis has refused Wade's advances, and there had just been another attack by the Sixers that had been thwarted. So Wade is back in reality in Columbus, Ohio, and he's all sad boy. He's just joylessly working at the next step and insert laundry list of 80s references here that he goes through he's not really into it though we go back to kind of a montage setup and he's sending all these unanswered messages to artemis like please take me back baby we can we can win it together i'll uh, we can fix the world with the money just like you wanted uh if if i have to win the egg to get you then so be it blah 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 it goes on forever never gets responded to wade keeps chasing all of these dead ends then one day 
he gets this message in kanji and it says when translated your princess is in another castle something i forgot oh to God. explain in the, in the uh in my summary is that there is another prominent gunter group it is a brother set from Japan who I think are called the um, Daisho brothers. One of them is one part of the, the katana set and the other one is the other kind of sword. But together the set is called a Daisho, so that's what we're going to call them. They are racist caricatures from the very beginning. All they talk about is honor. You know, obviously there are creative liberties taken with the fictional world, but I, I do want to go on record saying that I know a good bit of Japanese people in real life, and I they don't talk about honor or name themselves after katanas very often. So I just, it raised an eyebrow. It raised an eyebrow. So I was like, how are we going to incorporate these guys if they're already racial stereotypes? Well, I think the only logical next step is that they have betrayed wade and they have been bought out by the sixers because they're racist what gets revealed is that artemis is being kept prisoner in the location of the jade key which is the next key to unlock the easter egg and it's in a literal castle it's in um he-man's cat does he-man have a castle joshua um i think it's I think it's uh, the skull one that has the castle. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, so it's in Skeletor's castle. Castle Grey Skull, I think. Yeah, Castle Grey Skull. That sounds right, yeah. So he goes to Grey Skull Castle to to free Artemis and to get the Jade Key. And inside the castle is the cast of of Full House, the the eighties sitcom, which Halliday loved as a child because it reminded him of his broken family. So you have to, the challenge is you have to convince the parents in Full House not to get a divorce. So Halliday's there. (laughs) The Daisho brothers are there. Um, Artemis is like tied up. Um, and they're, they're watching, they're watching Wade, like consult, like play a uh, marriage counselor with the, the parents from Full House. And he gives this speech where he's like, love is when you accept someone no matter what, or what they look like or what they offer you. And like Artemis starts crying. She's like, I had no idea you felt like that Wade. That's like so deep or something. And it fixes the the um it fixes the full house marriage and he gets the jade key. And of course, because uh because what's his name? Uh Sorrento, because he's a bad guy, he's like, kill them, Japanese boys. But then the Daisho brothers are like, no, Wade, you have taught us that money is nothing compared to the value of honor. And they like commit seppuku because that's the only way this book could be possibly more offensive but they don't they don't do it before thwarting sorrento and freeing artemis so artemis and wade kind of run away but the the pressure's on they really have to they really have to find the next key the next gate and win the egg okay i'm gonna stop you there we're gonna do do a quick check-in so far um you were right about the racial stereotypes. Um, that's that's something. Um, so the twins are named Daito and Shoto. Uh-huh. They are brothers in the game, but it turns out that in real life, they've never actually met. Really? I, I thought they would be like real life brothers. That's so crazy. Yep, they've, they have never once met, but they, their avatars met in the game and they realized that they're both Japanese and then they got Japanese gay married. I don't know, but they're <laughs> brothers now. Um, so they, which means something. I don't really know what it means that I guess that they're hunting for the egg together. Wait, so did he meet them in your half? Because he also meets them in my half. Yeah, he met them um, at the basement when it was like for the first key was revealed. They're the first gunters were like, hey, we need to team up so that at least one of us gets it and not IOI. But then the the, the brothers were like, no, um, that's not honorable. We fight alone. Okay. 
Okay, so in the second half, the first time they're introduced, they are doing a side quest with Wade. Like, this is this is post-breakup. I think it's part of him recovering from the breakup. Um, they have to play through all 39 episodes of the TV show uh, Ultraman, which is a TV show about a guy who uh, gets in a, a robot suit and it grows really giant. Um, and it's like a, it's like a, you know, cardboard box city skyline type of situation. Um, coincidentally, this is one of the few references that I actually got. Like I've, I've seen an episode of the show and it, it's, you know, it's fun. They played through the TV show. I don't know what it is with this book and like quests in the game being just like play through this existing media and not like, like what, like why that sounds so boring, right? Like just playing a role through it. Like that's nothing. It doesn't test your skill. Anyway. So they play through all the episodes, and then the result is they get the Ultra Capsule, which I think is the thing that lets Ultraman transform. Um, and so so then the three of them, there's only one of them, so then the three of them have like a little fight um, about who's going to get it, but not like a fight fight, like a little argument. Um, and I think it's Shoto wants to give it to Wade because Wade was the one who found the quest, but then Daito is like, no way, he couldn't have finished the quest without us because it took three people to do it. And then Wade is like, no. This is Japan's greatest weapon, so it belongs in Japanese hands. Then he bows to hand them <laughs> the capsule, and they bow back. And oh, by the way, they're referring to him as Wade-san the whole time. Of course they... <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's what Because happens. every Japanese person keeps their honorifics in English. Yeah, oh, and when he's talking to them, he also uses honorifics. Oh my, okay, so they might be just, like, playing into him, you know, they're, like, humoring the white guy. I would love to believe that there's a version of this book that could be read that way, where, like, they're secretly making fun of him for being... Racist? Passive-aggressive and racist and, like, uh, micro-aggression-y, but I don't think that's what's happening. <laughs> I think it's just, like... He doesn't know. <laughs> okay, so they get the capsule. You gotta stop because we're we're cutting into um we're cutting into my genius prediction that's one hundred percent going to happen in real life. So the next key is the crystal key, and if I remember correctly, the twenty twenty one movie Kong versus Godzilla had magical like power crystals in it that were related to both of the the monsters in that movie so i remember from the trailer of the movie that the iron giant is in it so what i am envisioning so it's um it's wade and artemis kind of working together and they need to outfit the iron giant like he's a gundam to fight King Kong and Godzilla for the crystal key. And Sorrento's controlling King Kong. He's like Mecha King Kong. They get in this enormous fight and to receive the power-ups for the Iron Giant. This is where I'm going to bring in your thing. Um, they have to... Uh, what do they have to do? They have to act out every single song and dance in Footloose, which only H knows all of the, the songs and dance to. So that's how we bring him back in. There's this big fight, but not as big as the movie, because I think they don't do anything like um, in the movie with like all of the characters. I think it's just King Kong and Godzilla and the Iron Giant, and maybe there's a Transformer or two, and they kind of just like blow through the city uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Artemis can be on one of the Transformers driving around on uh, Optimus Prime or something. That'd be cool. Um, they win the crystal key and then the egg is revealed. And then it's just this Mario Kart style street race and and Wade's on the Iron Giant and 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 um, what's it? Sorrento's on King Kong. Uh, Artemis is on Optimus Prime. And um, H H is there. What is he on? He he's on He Man's Lion. I don't care. Um, they're all running and running and running. And then Sorrento throws a blue shell or a red shell. Was Mario Kart? No, Mario Kart wasn't a thing in the eighties. Whatever. You could make it a Excite Bike, huh? Excite Bike. That's a racing game. Excite Bike. Okay, so Sorrento throws an Excite Bike Caltrop, and it incapacitates Optimus Prime injuring artemis 
and Wade gives everything up to save the girl one last time. <laughs> and Sorrento grasps the egg and everything is lost. IOI has conquered Oasis and a new reign of terror is about to begin. Wade wakes up from his VR in his dingy, empty apartment as ads for new subscription services pop up all over his VR headset. And he's just filled with such sadness and remorse. And he feels like his whole life has worked up to nothing. And he's like, I can't take it anymore. If nothing else, I'm just going to get out of my apartment. And he walks out and he sees this pretty barren street. There's trash strewn around. And he's like, hmm, there's a trash can right there. Maybe I can start picking up some garbage around my apartment and feel like I've accomplished something. And he does it. And at first it's gross and he's smelly, but he feels the sun on his skin. He hears the birds chirping and he's like, wow, I'm really accomplishing something in real life here. And before he knows it, an entire block is free of, of trash. And he's, he's walking around. He's like, wow, I've never seen this part of the city before. And he runs in to a gorgeous, busty, amazing woman who looks nothing like any 80s movie character he's ever seen before. This is a true beauty. And he's like, well, hello, Madame Wazelle, because he doesn't know how to talk to women. Um, and he's like, and the, the woman looks at him and she's like, don't you recognize me, Parzival? It's me, H, and I'm a lesbian. Because that's the one thing I know that happened in, um, in the second half of the book. And it turns out that Artemis also lives in Columbus, Ohio. Oh my god. Over in the corner somewhere, and she is unconventionally attractive, but still attractive. And they're like, wow, we don't have a lot of money and we don't have a lot of resources, but if you could pick up an entire block of litter in one day, think about the, the progress that we can make if we talk to the people in our community and improve the world around us one little bit at a time. Maybe we won't fix all of the world's problems, but we can make Columbus, Ohio a great place to live. And Wade walks into the sunset holding Artemis's hand and Artemis is holding H's hand platonically and they all live happily ever after. The end. Make Ohio a nice place to live. Any percent challenge, impossible difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what makes it such a beautiful fantasy. <sighs> oh boy. You could also purchase an ACHD, anatomically correct haptic doll, if you wanted to have more intimate encounters inside the Oasis. ACHDs came in female, male, and dual sex models, and were available in a wide array of options. Realistic latex skin, servo mortar driven endoskeletons, simulated musculature, and all of the attendant appendages and orifices one could imagine. Driven by loneliness, curiosity, and raging teen hormones, I'd purchased a mid-ranged ACHD, the Shaptic Uber Betty, a few weeks after Artemis stopped talking to me. After spending several highly unproductive days inside a standalone brothel simulation called the Pleasure Dome, I'd gotten rid of the doll out of a combination of shame and self-preservation. That's disgusting. Why, what about it? Okay, so you really think that in this book that spends so much time just describing 80s properties for literally no reason, the moral is going to be, hey, what if we didn't do that? I, you know, I, Halliday could be read as a villain. I thought maybe he could play into that. Listen, I, a boy can dream, okay? Oh, can he? Oh, boy. How'd I do? How'd I do? You got a few things spot on, actually. Um, there is a giant robot fight featuring 
it's Mecha Godzilla, not Godzilla, but that's still pretty good. Ah, dang um, it! I would have said Mecha Godzilla, but I thought I, I already committed to King Kong. Um, dang it! Okay. I really liked when you said Artemis pilots Optimus Prime because while that does not happen, each of the main characters does get their own giant mech in the process of completing the keys challenge. And um, so, like, there is a big fight where they're all in mechs at the end. I knew it. Uh, I don't think the Iron Giant is mentioned at all, but I know that was in the movie trailer, so I don't blame you for for making that pull because that pull, it, it seems reasonable to assume that it could have been. Yeah, it was um, prominent. What else did you get right? Uh, you, of course, got the H thing right. That's another moment where the book is, like, trying so hard not to be racist that it, like, becomes racist. So I don't know what H's deal was in the first half, but in the second half, it's really important that H is Wade's best friend, a professional gamer, and that his identity is a secret. Right. Like, he won't tell anybody, not even Wade. It gets to a point where Sorrento has started figuring out everybody's real-life house, um, and he's just killing them. So the first person he kills is Daito. Um, he finds out where Daito lives in Tokyo and has him thrown off the roof and he makes it look like an accident. It makes it look like it wasn't IOI, right? Um, so when that happens, the group is, the friend group, which at that point then consists of Artemis, Wade, Shoto, and H, is like really freaked out. And they all decide to go on the run. So they abandon where they live and they each go to like different cafes or like other public places where they can temporarily rent gear to get into the Oasis and like play remotely, right? So at this point, Shoto's main motivation is to get revenge for Daito's death because they're brothers, right? And he's like Japanese. So like the honorable thing to do is get revenge for his dead brother's death or whatever. Right, of course. Um, Honor. Will that be resolved? Of course it will not. But don't worry about it. We'll get to that. So uh, they, they're, trying to, they're trying to stay on the run, but they realize they can't do this forever. So that's when Ogden just kind of shows up and is like, hey, kids, get in my unmarked private jet and I'll take you to my real life house. And I have the best gear and you can take down Sorrento for my place. Um, so then there's like unnecessary like logistics thing where the characters are like, but how are we going to get there? I'm in Japan. I'm in uh, Canada. I'm in Ohio. And Ogden's like, don't worry about it. I have so many jets. Here's a jet. There's a jet. We've all got jets. It's fine. But H is like, oh, wait, I live near Ohio. I'll come pick you up, Wade, on my way. Um, and so then there's a scene where Wade is like trying to stealth his way out of this cafe. And uh, the car that pulls up, the, the door opens. And lo and behold, who could be inside? Not a man, but a woman. And not just a woman a woman of color, and not just a woman of color, but a lesbian woman of color, and not just a lesbian woman of color, but a larger bodied woman of color who the book goes out of the way to say is not large in like a negative way, but like, you know, felt the need to call attention to it multiple times, but like doesn't want to be rude about it, but like keeps noticing it and it's like oh my god just stop just stop just stop wait 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 what 80s character does she look like um she looks like a human person in the world they don't compare her to the um to the one-eyed hag in dark crystal or something no they don't nothing she's just a woman like she's just a woman and she exists and she gives her whole backstory about being lesbian and not being accepted by her family and so running away and this exposition is not given in any kind of like interesting exchange or dialogue it's just like narration like it's just a couple paragraphs and it's like cool like awesome this is a good way to get me engaged with this character so yeah that was that it was uncomfortable especially piled on top of all of the japanese stuff um so anyway they make it to ogden's place and then that's when wade and artemis reunite but there's no time to talk now. We have to go take down Sorrento. Um, and then they just kind of, they just kind of do. I, I don't, I, I could detail for you like how they get the second two keys and how there's like a big uh, siege at uh, the, at Halliday's like castle that he used to live at when he was alive in the Oasis. Um, but it really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, there's a big robot fight and, um, Sorrento, so Shoto is like trying to kill Sorrento to get revenge for Daito's death, and then 
uh, Sorrento, who has not been in the book at this point, like since before when I started reading, because he's not in it until this point, uh, like at all. He has like maybe two lines of dialogue in the final fight, and then he kills Shoto, like he just kills him with a big beam out of Becca Godzilla's mouth. Oh and my that's god. Just it. Um, he doesn't die in real life, he just gets kicked out of, like, his avatar dies, and so he loses all of his gear and shit, but, like, you know. And that's the last we get of Shoto's, like, revenge arc. So, that just goes completely unresolved. Yeah, so, the third key, there's, like, some bullshit where all three, or, after they have all three keys to get through the last gate, they need to combine all three keys, and then they do, um, but then the, the Sixers set off a bomb that kills, it just instantly kills everybody in the area. Um, so, like, not only are their avatars wiped, but their their gear is destroyed, too. Just permanently, forever. Which is a thing that exists in this game world. Like, it's insane that an item of that power is around. Well, well, but Joshua, thankfully... items of that power are around here in real life. They're called nukes. Yeah, that's true. But uh, it's bad game design. <laughs> and this is supposed to be a game. Uh, this is supposed to be, like, escapism or something, but, like, the game just replicates real life, but, like, in the most boring ways, including there being nukes, I guess. So that happens, but thankfully Wade had the one extra life in the whole game that he got by playing Pac-Man after his breakup with Artemis. He went to a pizza parlor that Halliday used to go to when he was a kid. And then he played Pac-Man, and he got a perfect score on it because he's just so good at Pac-Man. He's the goodest at it. And then he got a quarter, and the quarter turned out to be a one-up. The only one-up in the game. So he comes back to life, steps through the gate, he meets Halliday. Halliday's like, here's your prize. It's total control over the Oasis, all of it. You can destroy it at any time. You can modify it in any way you want. But remember, have fun and be safe out there. Um, and it's like a pre-recorded message or whatever, so then he disappears. And then Wade gets ultimate power, and then he uh, he steps outside of the Oasis into Ogden's house, and oh god, I can hear how bored I sound talking about this because it really it really is delivered like this in the book where it's just like things happen, um, and there's no tension, there's no conflict because they ju he just does them. I didn't even mention the part where he allows himself to be captured by IOI and becomes like a grunt slave worker for them so that he can hack into their system. I never would have predicted that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so he he uncovers like a bunch of their data from the inside. Um, how does he do it? Because he just knew how to hack. He just already knew that. He had learned how to do it off screen and so he gets there and he does it and then he leaves. Anyway, um, yeah, so he gets the ultimate power, he goes outside and then he and Artemis like finally talk about the fact that they broke up and their conversation is just like, we're kissing now. And then the book ends. We're kissing now. <laughs> Wait, is yeah, that it? That's... Yeah. I mean, he describes like how, I don't know how boobily breasted this girl is for a couple paragraphs, but it's like, okay, cool. Great. Love that. Wait. So did the basement ever come back? Oh, sorry. You have questions about that summary? That's not enough for you? That wasn't good enough? <laughs> Did they ever go back to the basement? What, uh, H's basement? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they all do meet up there for a minute at one point. So the reason that they all start talking to Wade again after they cut ties with him is because... So he sneaks into the company and he uh, finds the files on the people that have not yet been killed and he sends it to them. And it is, is just like, hey, IOI is after you. Also, P.S. Artemis, I still think you're really sexy and beautiful and hot <laughs> and beautiful and sexy and I love your body and it's wonderful shapes and curves. Um, and I guess that does it for her because, you know, the next time that they interact, she's like dying to talk about it. And he's like, no, I'm so stoic. Uh, we have a job to do. Gotcha. I see. See, that was um. so that what I told you, my predictions, that was my good ending prediction. My neutral ending prediction was that Wade won normal uh, hero's journey kind of thing and then used it to preserve that that basement in Amber and him and all his friends gathered in the basement and they talked about 80s trivia. But then they were happy because they knew that their world was safe. So I'm really sad. It would have been a really nice chiasmus to have to uh, to come back to that place as a as a victor. But I guess we don't get nice things like that. No, we don't. We just get like 
the moral of the story is literally wish fulfillment is good. That's literally all it comes down to. Um, we can unpack that more in the like critique section, but I think that about does it for the summary. Oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. I didn't give closure on Sorrento and far be it for me to fail to give closure like this book does for the Daito and Shoto arc. Would you like to guess what happens after Sorrento, who's, uh, he's in the battlefield, so he's also blown up when the bomb goes off and is killed, but not in real life. Would you like to guess what happens to him? Okay, so Wade gets his one up, um, and he he's he's crawling through the ashes towards whatever, the egg, and then he's grabbed out of nowhere, and he has, like, the equivalent of, like, a focus sash in Pokemon, where you can survive with, like, one HP, <laughs> and he's like... I'm going to get you, Wade. I'm going to I'm going to get you. And there's like his his avatar starts to flicker and he's like a little gross baby boy. He's like a 13 year old. He's not like a he's not like a an adult man. And uh, he kicks he kicks him again, loses one HP. And that's the last we ever hear of him um, so that we can have him for a sequel. But what actually happens to him? Oh, he gets arrested off screen. He gets arrested off screen. Yeah, he gets arrested off screen. Not even like, like, how how did his avatar die? Did he just die in the explosion? Yeah, so the way the explosion works is it's like a legendary item of which there is only one, and it kills every single avatar that's in the sector that it goes off in. And, and Sorrento so for, did this without having anything in place for him to survive? That is correct. That's awesome. That's so cool. I love you, Ernest. Yeah, so uh, Wade, Wade, once he becomes, I don't know, God King of the oasis he uses his divine power to uh release the files that sorrento was keeping about how to assassinate children um he releases it to like the media and then you know sorrento just gets arrested off screen like literally one of the characters is like oh my god wade look at that and then they all turn around and on the tv it's like sorrento being led out of the building in in handcuffs by the feds which was really confusing to me because I was under the impression that the government like didn't have any power or was like a puppet of IOI, but apparently they can arrest big CEOs if there's, I don't know, evidence on them. But like, if the government has that kind of authority, like, why does IOI get to do the things that it does, like vis-a-vis -vis slavery? So, so that was kind of what my little one of my little pet theories is. Uh, this, okay, so this is what I'm going to do for my critique because I'm only going to compare it to existing property because that's all this book does. It's like oh, encourage the cowardly dog how they live in a house in the middle of nowhere. But there's this fan theory that that's just courage the cowardly dog's world. Like he he's a dog. He doesn't know what else is out there and everything to him is as scary as it is, but it's not like actually happening in the in the world. So... I, I failed to mention that in the exposition at the beginning, Wade goes on this rant against the modern world and God and Earth. So my headcanon is it's it's not that bad. Like maybe things are worse than they are now in 2044, but it's nowhere near as bad as Wade is making it out to be. And he just happens to be kind of this disenfranchised, unlucky person in life. I like, kind of like that reading because, and I'm glad you brought up environmental description because that's something I forgot to ask you about. But in the second half, there's only one time when the outside world is described in terms of its like physical appearance. And it's actually not even really a description of the world. It's like sort of a dodge because Wade has been arrested for intentionally going into debt so that he'll be taken in to be a slave of IOI. And as they're leading him out of his apartment, he talks about how the whole world is decayed and covered in i don't know dust but like that's all he says that doesn't actually tell us anything there's no specific images of particular buildings or nature or lack of nature and when he gets inside the walls of ioi everything seems to be totally fine the people that aren't slaves are you know they're they're comfortable enough um if they're high enough up in the company it, it sort of gives like a district one hunger games sort of vibes um, where everyone's, you know, just kind of doing whatever to be a cog in the machine and get by. Um, but yeah, like the, the world could be whatever you want it to be. Yep. No, that it, that's pretty much the extent of the environmental description that we get in, in my half. Now I will grant that, um, 
that he does live in a crappy trailer park. But crappy trailer parks have existed since time immemorial. And like I said, stacking trailers is is a thing that people can do. So it, it, nothing was particularly apocalyptic, in my opinion. And then, like, I remember a little bit about Columbus, Ohio being a crappy place, but I can't imagine that the real-life Columbus, Ohio is much better. That story you heard about how we were all created by a super-powerful dude named God who lives up in the sky? Total bullshit. The whole God thing is actually an ancient fairy tale that people have been telling one another for thousands of years. We made it all up like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Oh, and by the way, there's no Santa Claus or Easter Bunny. Also bullshit. Sorry, kid. Deal with it. I can't believe he did the joke from Megamind, where he's like, I mean, there, there is no Easter Bunny, there is no Tooth Fairy, and there is no Queen of England. <laughs> but seriously, like, like, the... It, in a bad mood, I could describe like my my idyllic little neighborhood just like he does. It, it's it's all a matter of his perspective. So I that's my little fan theory is that the world isn't actually that bad. Yeah, I think that's probably not without credence. I think the only thing that might complicate that is now that we have a movie. If we assume that it's meant to be an ap- accurate representation of the book's world, I think in the movie. Based on the trailer that I've seen, it looks like pretty post-apocalyptic. Or I guess like parts right, of the trailer. So, I don't know that I ever watched one from start to finish. Well, courage the cowardly dog logic either way. Well, Joshua, um, let's take things back into our normal structure and talk about what we liked about Ernest Klein's work. Okay, in my usual fashion, I have a thing that I like that turns into a thing that I dislike a lot. <laughs> so... Coming into it, starting at chapter 19, I actually really appreciated how the novel gave context for most of the references that it dropped. Um, You know, with the exception of, like, Pac-Man. It doesn't go go into, like, Pac-Man was released in 1981 as an arcade cabinet. It's like, it it just says Pac-Man. But for some of the more obscure stuff, it actually describes it. Like, there's an arcade game that's important for getting, I think it's the second key, called Black Tiger, which was, like, more popular in Japan than it was in the U.S., and so it describes what kind of game it is, so you have context for the things that Wade does inside, um, which I thought was good, because otherwise, like, you really would have no idea. Yeah. But then the the other side of that coin is, the other side of that secret one-up quarter, if you will, <laughs> is that, you know, by the 30th time that happens, it's like, I've been trained to know not to give a shit, because what's realistically going to occur is we're going to have this long-winded description of this 80s property that's going to be relevant for literally one single plot point, and then we'll be moved past and never acknowledged again. Yep, that that is the pattern. That is entirely the pattern. Yeah, and, and this kind of ties into my biggest pro of the book is that the voice is 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 right where it needs to be. I can completely believe that Wade Wilson is this obsessed with with 80s properties. Now, that might be an extension of kind of Ernest Cline's personality. I'll grant that. But like the beginning rant against religion and the modern world was probably lifted out of my diary when I was 14. Like, it's annoying. I don't like Wade, but I like his voice as a narrator. And I think it carries what would otherwise be very dry lists of things that exist in the 80s which it already is but it would be drier without honestly you know not having read that rant against god in the modern world i would describe wade as very dry just based on what he does really in the second half he really doesn't have much personality or interest in things like the novel tells us that he is excited and has a good time reciting line for line the entire script of uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which, yes, yes, it does occupy two Gregorian pages of this book. Just the opening scene of Monty Python. Oh, my God. With the King Arthur and the little assistant guy and the whole shebang. That's awful. Yeah, I... I couldn't believe it. There's not even, like, interjections of Wade's thoughts to be like, haha, this was my favorite part. It's just like... This is the line from the movie. This is the next line from the movie. Here's some environmental description of what's on the scene at this point. Anyway, um, yeah, so, like, we're told that he's enjoying things, but, like, are we ever shown him having a good time? 
or hating something. I mean, not really. The most we get is arrogance. Like when he's hacking into the, the system at IOI, he's like, it's so easy to hack into this system. And then we get horniness because the, uh, the thing that happens, the thing that happens at the beginning of chapter 19 is we get this three page monologue about him in the post breakup Wait, with Artemis. Period. Like actually? Yeah, no, he spends three pages jerking off. Jesus Christ, Ernest, really? That's awful. It, it climaxes, if you'll pardon the pun, with him um, buying like a super realistic sex robot and having sex with it. And then being like, I realize now that this is also just jerking off because it's only simulated human interaction. And so he throws it out. Oh my God. Yeah, it's a thing. I think I think the phrase like raging teenage hormones is used at some point. Something like that. That that just ruined my day. I didn't know about that part. Okay, we got to we got to stay focused on the good things. We got to stay focused. Uh, uh the the story was very followable. Um I I think the premise was very clear and it the stakes were never never obfuscated. Yeah, it does have like its goal in sight. It knows what it wants to be. It knows exactly what it wants to be and if that's your <laughs> thing then uh more power to you. How you know, hey, at least H was a lesbian you know he it could have just been he was just like a teenage boy just like uh just like wade is so the fact that h was even you know made into a person that was not a white scrawny teenage boy says something yeah i think Ernest it really is trying to be inclusive by making h this like grab bag of intersectional uh, minoritarian identities i feel like there's a genuine attempt being made at saying like look nerds can be anything um and this comes up in the poem that we'll talk about too but ultimately i think it fails because it's like creepy about it right yeah obviously i'm saying this without actually having read the part that is in question but i sure, wasn't yeah, sure, as yeah. put off as some people might be I've always been I've always been a softy for straight lesbian friendships. As someone with a lesbian as one of his best friends, I I, I have a soft spot for that. Yeah, the no, idea of it's nice. Yeah, it's a good thing. Like you said, it does read in a really nice clip. I could see, I, you know, I could almost see like a fifteen year old version of myself maybe uh, picking this up in a Barnes and Noble and being like, oh, cool, it's like got things in it that I recognize. Um, and, you know, enjoying it and then forgetting about it forever. But in the moment, it might provide a momentary pleasure. Just like a sex bot. Just like a good sex bot. For a moment, I was too starstruck to speak. To break my paralysis, I reminded myself that the person operating the avatar in front of me might not be a woman at all. This girl, whom I had been cyber crushing on for the past three years, might very well be an obese hairy knuckled guy named chuck so <laughs> he is only able to interact with her by imagining she is not a woman this is kind of like neon genesis evangelion where if you ask someone whether they like it and they saw it or they read it in this case before they were 14 they like it but if you explain it or ask someone who has read it after 14, they hate it. There's a line. You have to be a very specific market to really, really get the intended effect here. And I, I do believe that is intentional. So we can spin this into a pro is that this, this really plays to its target market. Yeah, I think that is key. It really is targeted at a specific market. But I also think it's strange that on the back of my copy, at least, it says... It's the grown-ups Harry Potter in this quote from the Huffington Post, which, as aside from how that hasn't aged well, um, it's, it's weird because I can't really see an adult enjoying this unless they are really feeling super nostalgic about the 80s. Because, like, adults have much better media to choose from, frankly. Much more complex, nuanced stories that, that can still be said in the 80s, can still reference 80s properties without that being the only thing. But it was it was in my childhood, Joshua. I remember playing Pac-Man. I remember uh, uh, Mega Man. 
That's awesome, dude. I love that. It's just sad. It's a sad state of affairs. It is a sad state of affairs. I feel like uh, I can't even say this is passionless uh, because like I feel like Ernest Klein really does care about this, but it the result feels like devoid of love in a strange way. Yeah, so I guess I guess we we gave it our good college try, Ernest, but we're going to have to get into more of the cons areas for improvement and and ways to take this this seminal work forward because I I don't think we could commit to the bit of being positive. No, it's so hard. It's really truly very very hard. Hey, hey I have one um, last positive. I have one last positive. Um this book okay. And I, I'm not being facetious. This book is the only book that has elicited a genuine and deep emotional response for me. Was this positive? Really not, no, but... but not, it, not even Empress Teresa? Not even Empress Teresa. Not even Empress Teresa made me this angry. This might be a good time for the Andrew soapbox period. I am not like Norman Bhutan. I flatter myself to say. I'm not like Lanny Serum. I'm not like Ben Shapiro. Like, I am like Ernest Klein. I I may not be as obsessed with the 80s. I may not even care particularly for the 80s. But I know what it's like to be a weird 14-year-old with very specific uh, hyper fixations and a very specific love of my oasis, which I would, in our era, be the internet. And... It, it really, really made me think about kind of the internet philosophically, and it led me to a revelation that's kind of defined my life for the past couple of months. And I'm being completely, completely unironic here in the age of chat GPT and AI and all of this, all of this technological innovations and the, the, the way that the internet is changing. Because the thing is, Joshua, and this is, this is something I care deeply about, Ernest Klein is completely 100% right about what's going on in the fight for the internet. Oh, you're talking about corporate control. Right. I'm talking about corporate control. The internet is getting smaller, it's getting more expensive, and it's getting more more draconianly regulated. And I used to think that this was a bad thing. I used to be really, really worried about the future of our freedom on the internet. I, I the, the Sixers are at the gates and they are ready to take everything over. But the problem is Gunters are all racist incels. Like, what are we fighting to preserve? That we we are fighting for these these 80s pop culture references, these these Reagan era deregulated psyops that exist to take money from children. There's there's nothing of value. I really do hope that the Sixers win because I want us all to get out of our VR headsets and start picking up trash in Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> well, I think I see what you're saying about maybe the internet can do with a little bit more regulation, but I don't know if like a mega corporation that's like multinational and trying to assassinate children is necessarily the right organizational <laughs> body to do that work. Okay, maybe um, maybe, maybe not IOI, but Meta or something. I don't know. I don't know about any of our, I don't think any of our real world corporations uh, are fit for that task either. And I also don't think the US government is right for it. But I, I do hear <laughs> what you're saying about regulation being a thing that could be good uh, in the face of like, stochastic terrorism well no i i want them to i want them to ruin it i'm not saying it would be a good thing i want them to ruin the internet i think it would be a good thing if if everyone just got over it got over the oasis i i don't know i think it i think it has a lot of power to bring people together but i do think that there's a point the good point you're making about what are we fighting to preserve because if the thing we're fighting to preserve is literally just like here are some references i enjoy and also here is a safe haven for like people to come and be racist. Yeah, that's not a thing that's worth preserving. We can definitely do better than that. Yeah, obviously this this version of reality is 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 very divorced from what I would consider normal and or moral and the the treatment of of women is something that is throughout the novel and and particularly egregious. Yeah, it's I mean 
it's all the words that you're probably already thinking of as a member of the English club. You know, it's objectifying, it's tokenizing, it's blah, 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 blah. Like, it's, it's gross. It's uncomfortable. Um, and it's... I, I don't know how it got past editing, to be frank. I mean, it, it's just really baffling. Like, it's so obviously creepy and the fact that Wade as a character never becomes aware of it, never goes past it. And it never even goes addressed by other characters because, you know, he rarely actually voices aloud anything that's untoward. The novel isn't willing to examine it, which makes me wonder why, which makes me think like, is Ernest good? <laughs> and then I read his poetry. <laughs> I don't know. I, I talked about this earlier, but it, I could, I could have accepted male gazy. I could have accepted, oh, she was hot because we're, we're supposed to understand that this is a, a 14 year old internet sick weirdo, but it was just empty. Artemis isn't hot. She's hot because she reminds Wade of a, of a fictional character. Nothing down to human interaction, human attraction existed for its own sake and and that was more scary to me than any dystopia is the the idea that we can just divorce someone from their humanity like or or value as an object even you know it, it's it's an extra layer that i didn't think was possible yeah that's a really good point there's nothing that exists in the novel that isn't in relation to a pre-existing thing and the fact that it's even infected Wade's, like, sexuality is such an interesting idea that it's a shame the novel doesn't have more to say about it. It just presents it as being there and then refuses to examine it. Yeah, I would have loved it. I, I'm so interested in that question that you had earlier about did anyone call into question Halliday's, Halliday's uh, influence over the world or acknowledge the 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 hubris that would go into something like that because it, it would exist as a proxy for wade's mentality to to call halliday into question and maybe at least in the subtext he could start to address his own issues with his interactions with the world to realize oh hey this guy kind of sucks yeah this guy he has no identity of his own he exists only as this amalgamation of properties that were fed to him by external forces by ronald um, reagan by ronald reagan himself reagan backed up to halliday's house with a big cement mixer full of 80s properties <laughs> and he poured them right in through the window uh and then he said good luck jack or whatever ronald reagan's catchphrase was uh <laughs> and then he just kind of you know let that work itself out and look what it did that's all canon <laughs> you're evil you know that i said she grinned and shook her head. Chaotic neutral sugar. It's, um, th there's, there is a lot of potential for interesting, like, sociological examinations of an internet-obsessed world. There's, a uh, potential for a great character study about what adolescence, I mean, uh, development looks like in the internet. The novel seems invested in sex so like the sexual development of a young person in the age of the internet but i mean it just doesn't do any of that instead it just lists things that exist which like i can go to an almanac for that or like a dictionary or the internet now that i think about it um so like why why is this book well i'm worried that this is an uncritical reflection of the author's own personality is the why. And uh, I, I'm really wary about even going down this, this line of thought. It, it's unfair. I, I will fully acknowledge that this is hypocritical of us because we killed Lanny Serum. We killed Benjamin Shapiro even. Like, we didn't talk about him that much. But, well, to be fair... Ben Shapiro's a fed and I'm pretty sure Ernest Klein's not. So we had plausible deniability there. So Ernest Klein is like bleeding through this book. Yeah, I think you're right. Maybe it is a little bit unfair, but you're also right that the, I mean, the novel is sold as 
hey, I'm Ernest Klein, and this is like my whole deal. I mean, what is his bio on the back again? It's, he's a screenwriter, spoken word artist, and full-time geek. He lives in Austin, Texas with his wife, blah, 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 blah. He loves video games, and Ready Player One is his first novel. Like, he's just really spitting that back out to us in the form of a novel. And I think that, you know, when he hawked up that loogie, it happened to catch a few other things on the way up, being opinions on women. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to read this in my best poetry MFA voice. <clears throat> I've noticed that there don't seem to be any porn movies that are made for guys like me. All the porn I've come across was targeted at beer-swilling, sports bar-dwelling alpha males. Men who like their women stupid and submissive. Men who can only get it up for monosyllabic, cock-hungry nymphos with gargantuan breasts and a three-word vocabulary. Adult films are populated with these collagen-injected, liposuctioned women, many of whom have resorted to surgery and self-mutilation in an attempt to look the way they have been told to look. God, these aren't real women. They're objects. And these movies aren't erotic. They're pathetic. These vacuum-headed f bunnies don't turn me on. They disgust me. And it's not that I'm against pornography. I mean, I'm a guy. And guys need porn. Fact. Like a preacher needs pain. Like a needle needs a vein. Guys need porn. You can have the whole cheerleading squad. I want the girl in the tweed skirt and the horn-rimmed glasses. Betty Finnebowski, the valedictorian. Oh yes. First, I want to copy her trig homework, and then I want to make mad, passionate love to her for hours and hours until she reluctantly asks if we can stop because she doesn't want to miss Battlestar Galactica. Summa cum laude, baby. Buy stock in some hand cream companies, because there's about to be a major shortage. And I'm not just talking about straight porn. Oh no. There should be films for my nerd brethren of all sexual orientations. I am going to make millions because this country is full of database programmers and electronics engineers and they aren't getting the loving they so desperately need. And you can help. If you're an intelligent woman that is interested in breaking into the adult film industry, and if you can tell me the name of Luke Skywalker's home planet, then you're hired. D Are there people who don't know what Tatooine is? Well, actually, Luke was born on Polis Massa, so I don't think that's Oh, cool, his okay, oh, cool, cool. That was actually a test. I'm hanging up the call now. Cool. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you think you're overweight or unattractive. It doesn't matter if you don't think you're beautiful. You are beautiful. And I will make you a star. That's it now? Okay. I, um, I was picturing him staring down a random girl in his class the entire time he read that aloud in front of everyone. There's like a token mention of like the LGBT community. Yes. Yes. So just shoehorned in there just so we're, we're clear that we're all woke here. Just so you know, he's cool. He's chill with the gays. I also think it's really interesting the way the speaker like projects onto the outside world, right? Like the speaker is assuming that all nerds like the exact same things he does. Like they're just waiting for someone to come along and give them the sexual gratification that only he and his nerd porn ideas can provide. What are we fighting for here? What, what is this all about? Why, ca why can't Sorrento just have this if, if all we're going to get out of this is um, Dungeons and Dragons porn poetry? I don't know, because I think, I think that, I don't think that like the, that multinational corporations have a right to take away this, huge sphere of life just because it's currently being misused in some areas what if it was never good in the first place i feel like that's a huge claim that you'd really have to back up with a lot of evidence i mean this podcast wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the internet my evidence is that entire poem which you were only able to find because of the internet okay well at least reddit let's take reddit down everything else everything else we can we can keep <laughs> world would be a better place okay fair enough i yeah you know i feel like if we took reddit down we would know who the bad ones were because they'd be complaining about Reddit being taken down. <laughs> 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 Everyone else would just kind of cope. Okay, so we took a little detour to talk about Ernest Klein's poem. 
But Andrew, this wouldn't be the English Club podcast if we weren't able to close out with some actual tangible suggested fixes for Ernest, who certainly is going to hear this podcast, take these edits to heart, and re-release Ready Player One as a brand new book with a shiny new cover and hopefully some different words rearranged, or at very least, some of the words taken out. Give Wade Wilson any remote semblance of a character arc. Please, God, I'm begging you. I don't care if it's not a good one. I Just, like, anything but what you currently have. If he, if he grows even a, a slightly as a better person, that's at least something. Does he undergo any kind of change in the first half? Uh, he his attraction for artemis deepens i mean does like does his getting roped into the search for the egg like awaken some desire in him to answer some greater call no he he just does it because he wants money uh so so yeah it it, desire greater call like these are things you could shoehorn into the narration without altering the plot structure at all so th- this is that's a freebie, Ernest. You can you can take that one today. Yeah, honestly, he could just be like, "Hey, Sorrento, you Uncle Ben, my uncle, you Aunt Barood, my aunt. Um, now I'm gonna kill you because you're a bad person who kills people. And if I kill you, it will make the world a better place. And it's that simple. In the future, those are both words for immolation. They don't say immolation anymore. They just say Uncle Ben and Aunt Barood. <laughs> Uh. or or um and i looked into artemis's eyes after we kissed and for the first time i saw a human being the end that's it there you go you don't have to alter anything wait but the human being i have to ask was she like did she resemble like a character from like conan the barbarian or like from galaxy quest or no, no, no. See, that's this is how you can this is how you can keep the good ending with doing the littlest amount of work possible is you just end it on there. Human being period done in the book and you can say that it um that's like how um that's like John Green's excuse for uh I think it was Paper Towns is Paper Towns is about the dangers of Manic Pixie Dream Girls. So this can be about the dangers of being a, a weird incel gamer freak who needs to be stuffed in a locker. And all you need is just one line at the end. I will. I definitely like the idea of the book ending. <laughs> all right, what, what do you got? What do you got then? So I listen, not to be like one of those people that's like, well, Sorted Online isn't a good anime because the game doesn't make sense. But um, Ready Player One is a bad book because the game doesn't make sense. So ostensibly it's like half life sim half mmorpg where there's like areas that are pvp and areas that aren't um but this structure like just patently doesn't make sense i don't think uh not for a video game because what it would realistically result in is like people creating dozens of like spoof accounts where they're just waiting around corners to ambush and assassinate the most powerful players. You know, they would get just strong enough that they feasibly could kill someone, and then they would do that and take all their loot. Because when you die in this game, you drop all of your loot like it's Minecraft, and your avatar is permanently dead. At least as far as I know from the second half, you cannot recreate an avatar that has died. Wade's 1-Up is special because it's the only thing that lets you bring back a dead avatar. So, so yeah, I, it kind of goes back to the whole magic system thing, right? Like... Well, you, you, if you can pull out a kill everyone nuke at the last second, then how are we supposed to be invested in the limitations or possibilities of your world? I mean, the meta of it, frankly, is just it's nonsense. Um, in the second half, they keep introducing all these like random magical items that there's only one of. And they just, basically, each of them does something that's extremely overpowered. So obviously the bomb is one, the one-up is one, Ultraman's Ultra Capsule is one. There's another that leads to the siege at the castle. Um, It's an orb that it requires a high-level wizard to operate it. So apparently there there are classes, right? Because, like, there's wizards, but, like, Wade is more of, like, a technology build. Um, And there's certain areas where he mentions that, like, magic or technology is deactivated. And so it's, like fantasy or sci-fi um which that's a whole other thing i don't think that could be balanceable but 
anyway, this orb requires a, a wizard to operate it. And the thing that the orb does is, as long as the wizard is operating it, it creates a spherical force field that cannot be penetrated by anything. You can't teleport in and out of it. You can't walk through it. Nothing. You can't go under it because they tried, like, so the wizard is standing on, on the ground, right? And so, like, they're like, oh, we'll just dig underneath him. But no, the orb goes through the earth. So just, like, that's it. Why? Like, it just creates, like, this stalemate situation? That's not interesting gameplay. What is this shit? Yeah, what if I could just get a Death Star from the Star Wars world, which exists right beside the Star Trek and the Battlestar Galactica world, by the way. What if I just get a Death Star and, like, blow up everyone that I don't like? Then your wizard force field is just going to float in the ether. Sucks to suck. Yeah, or like, what, or, like... <laughs> What about the fact that, like, this wizard force field is, like, cutting through solid surfaces? So, like, what if you... So, like, people try to walk through it and get disintegrated, right? So, like, what if you're a wizard and you just, like, open and close this orb so that people that are at its max shield distance just, like, get sliced in half constantly? Questions we will never have the answer to because he just wanted a force field for one scene. Yeah, and none of these magic items that, like, all have cool D&D type names, like, they never get histories or foreshadow they're never foreshadowed like they just show up when they're needed and then when they're not needed they go away it's it's so transparent um it's depressing it's it's shallow it feels i mean i, I want to say it feels like almost callous in its disregard for creating an interesting narrative but like i i, I don't think it is i just think that this is Ernest writing a story <sighs> This really is just Ernest writing a story, isn't it? The main thing is the novel has no conflict. So, like, on the surface, it has conflict. Like, you can describe the things that occur in terms of conflict, right? Like, they all want the egg. Sorrento wants the egg. Like, they're fighting physically. That is technically conflict, but there's never any struggle to overcome. You get what I'm saying? Uh, like, like internally, or there's there is that. Like Wade never has to like he never undergoes any emotional strife uh, to grow as a person. You know, even the the masturbation episode is just like I was sad, then I realized not to be sad, and then I wasn't sad. Ooh, ooh, ooh! ooh. So I'm listening to um, Perks of Being a Wallflower right now. What if you leaned full into? like Wade as this emotionally stunted weirdo and we still we we may never get any conscious thought about it but we can still rest a little bit easier knowing that there's a separation between what this guy is saying and what the author actually thinks and acts like yeah i think that's key uh just because the other media that the author has put out is like pretty blatantly speaker as author e like it, there seems to be a very thin separation between speaker and writer and so like something that confirms that that separation does exist would be very welcome in my eyes it'd be fun it'd be easy too because i mean you, you you know what voice is earnest like it, it it works a little bit at least in the first half maybe joshua will disagree but i i really thought i didn't like wade but i i knew the way he was and i understood the way that he was so so you you got the core concepts there you can just kind of lean into that a little bit more yeah the novel really just needs something that tells us we're not supposed to like wade or that his actions are not to be emulated and i actually think this is something i've been percolating on since we started talking but i, I kind of think that the novel could benefit like really heavily from like an everyman type character like i don't think this should be told from wade's point of view i think maybe like wade should meet somebody early on that for some kind of plot reason he can't be separated from like maybe maybe to enroll in the contest to get the egg you have to pick a partner and through some contrivance his partner who you cannot change is some guy who's like level two <laughs> and like is wearing like leather armor and a tunic and has like a dagger that's about to break wait that's so um, fun yes and so I think that, like, this guy who, like, doesn't know much about Halliday is just playing the game for fun, enrolled in the Easter egg quest on a whim, and um, it doesn't give a shit about the 80s, 
would be like so baffled by Wade's behavior and his willingness to hack into a multinational company on a chance that it might get him a video game item, you know? It's why um, Sherlock Holmes stories are never first person, because it would be so annoying to read something from his perspective. Oh my god, this is genius. Yeah, just give a guy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we need like a Watson, because Wade really is Sherlock Holmes-like in the way that he's like kind of indifferent to other people's problems and is also a super genius, but like is a Twitch streamer, essentially. Like, he, he makes a living by, like, streaming himself playing in the Oasis. So, like, if, for all intents and purposes, he's, like, a Twitch streamer, but, like, on steroids. Um, so, like, there's no, really no reason he should have all these skills, but he does, for whatever reason. So I think that, like, somebody who's, like, amazed and weirded out and uh, willing to follow along would be a super welcome inclusion. And it could be somebody that, like, Wade could bounce his weird ideas about women off of, and then that person could be like, hey, man, Maybe don't. Yeah. Oh, God, that's genius. I love that. I love that so much. Um, do that, Ernest. That'll that'll fix everything. You know, I honestly think that H could be that character. H could be that character. H, like, seemed the most normal pilled of all of them. <laughs> Normie core H. Ooh, hey, can we get rid of the... Okay, well, we don't have to get rid of them because that would... I guess that's also problematic. But the Japanese brothers, c can you talk to a Japanese person, period, and change your characterization of the brothers based off of your notes from that interaction because I, i'm not some globe trotter but like i i think i could sniff out some caricatures when i when i see them yeah i mean i think it really just is because like in the mind of this novel japanese people exist as japanese media from the 80s and so, like, of course, when Japanese people show up, they're going to act like, yeah, you know, TV stereotypes, because, like, that's all this book knows. Because, I mean, Wade is just a, a, a Western stereotype. You're kind of right about that one. That's a tricky one. No, no, I don't think you're wrong. I think it should be changed. I just think it's not a surprise that they are the way they are. Oh, yeah. no, that's, I'm, I'm not surprised, but I still wish it would change. So, so, uh, the thing I was saying with H, I want to circle back to this because I had, I had more ideas uh, while we were talking. So, so I, I think that, um, so when H is revealed to be like a lesbian woman of color, um, then the, the novel treats it as like a twist, right? It's like, oh my God, a girl who's into video games and she's not straight and she's not white. And for some reason, her body size is of interest. Um, and it's just like, if you're going to make it a twist, I think... I think that it would be it could be an interesting twist if previously H had been maybe a novice in the game who was tagging along with Wade and then you know she had she under the guise of being a man had you know pushed back against some of the weird stuff he said about like minorities and then you know like it turns out that she herself is a minority you know by several different intersections and then Wade would be like oh, wow, um, I learned empathy from this. And, like, I think it's sad that it has to come to that point where, like, the only way he can learn empathy for other people is to, like, realize a person he thought was white uh, was not white and then, like, you know, develops empathy by proxy. Like, that's really a tragedy. But, like, if that's what it has to be for this, like, shell of a person to grow, then so be it, honestly. And I think that's that itself could be framed as, like, an interesting sort of tragedy. Um, sort of like a... David Lurie in uh, J.M. Quetzia's Disgrace, where he's just like a total shithead. And uh, it takes it takes seeing himself in like these dogs that are about to be killed for him to develop empathy for like animals oh and women. Oh my God, yeah. Um, I mean, there are means and there are ends. And if these are our building blocks, then we are going to have to really make our means justify our ends. And if that means being slightly problematic for a for a tragedy that's ultimately for the better i i think we can even ourselves out karmatically i don't know if it's impossible or i don't know if it's possible to be completely unproblematic in the eyes of all people at all times just because like there's a limit we... though let's not be reductive here yeah there, i i recognize that you're you're never going to be completely uh free of all sin but Come on, they're calling him Wade Son. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm, we're I'm not say Kelton College like trigger warning liberals here. We're we're being very normal, I think. 
Yeah, no, I, I just think that like if it's going to be a twist when it turns out that H is a woman, then the twist could be like, hey, you're seeing now that I'm a woman and those things that you were saying about women earlier, like they were really hurtful, not just to the women that you were talking about to me, but like to me as a woman. And like that might make Wade self-examine. And like, I can see a good scene coming out of that. So like, like you're saying, like allowing Wade to be problematic so that it can be treated with the necessary gravity later. Um, almost like a, a setup and a payoff, like a sort of narrative structure of sorts. Because I don't think that uh, H's identity is set up at all. I mean, other than it's like, oh, it's a secret, but like most of them are secrets. So like, okay. There actually is a lot I don't know about 80s pop culture references. This book made me realize that. I mean, as I was reading it, I did get a little shot of dopamine every time I recognized something. That's how they get you. The the first one's always free, Joshua. That was the moment when I was like, oh, okay, I kind of get why this worked for some people, right? Because I the reason I had watched an episode of Ultraman was because I had a friend whose dad used to like it when he was a kid. And so he had showed it to us like many years hence. And I was like, oh, that's that's charming. You know, I, I remember this. Um, but that doesn't sustain an entire novel. It really, it really doesn't. And, and I think this is a lesson learned the hard way. But I do think the potential is there for, for some interesting things. Like with any story, it's not about concept so much as execution. And to, we can't manifestly dismiss this just because Wade's kind of annoying and problematic and you can't just tell a story by listing 80s references. There is, there is something that can be redeemed here. Yeah, there is. And I, I wish that we could do more than just provide alternate concepts. Um, I guess we could write fan fiction of a better version of this book. You know, earlier in the in the club meeting, you, you were describing the giant robot fight as you envisioned it. And the way that you were talking about it was like, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. And I had this moment where I was like, is this what it was like inside Ernest Klein's mind as he was writing this? Because that's how it appears on the page. <laughs> it really is just like this happens, then this happens, then that happens. I had a lot of fun coming up with that story. <laughs> and I think I think that's key, right? Like I can really imagine that as he was writing this, he was like, oh, this is so cool. There's so many good ideas here. I can make all of these cool properties that I have a deep emotional attachment to come alive together in the same place and they could duke it out for supremacy. Uh, Injustice style uh, or I don't know Marvel versus Capcom style or Smash Bros style and it's like yeah this is exciting to me the idea of it but then the execution is just like it's kind of nothing. <laughs> I'm glad you had fun Ernest. There's always Ready Player 2. That's true. Do you know anything about that? We'll find out in the dramatic sequel to this episode. <laughs> oh god. We're not doing that are we? We might. Depends on uh, what people want. Despite what I'd said to H... Knowing that I was about to meet him in person after all these years made me more nervous than I wanted to admit. H's tiny RV was just a few yards away, parked at the curb. A heavy-set African-American girl sat in the RV's driver's seat, clutching the wheel tightly and staring straight ahead. She was about my age, with short, kinky hair and chocolate-colored skin. He did not say that. He did not say that. How could he... She deceived me all these years. I felt my face flush with embarrassment as I remembered all of the adolescent intimacies I'd shared with H, a person I'd trusted implicitly, someone I thought I knew. No, Joshua. Well, Ernest, it's always a really hard conversation to have when we can't even pretend to be very positive about a book. But I hope it wasn't lost on you, the potential that this book has. Now, I, I will give you a word of warning that there is a long way to go with this book, and maybe also your own spiritual journey. When I read this book, when I read my half, I got on my knees and I thanked God for every single person who has ever bullied me in my life. Because if this is what geek culture is, the world you present, it may be more bleak than even you know. And I hope you take that into consideration when you move forward, the implications of the things that you're doing and saying. I think that is sort of an interesting critique buried in there, though. The idea that this book wants to like put geek culture 
on an almost like institutionalized religion level of importance. And yet it presents for us a world in which that has come to pass. And it is a blasted hellscape. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like uh, something you said to me off the air was it was like they tore down the altars of the gods and replaced them with Funko Pops or something like that. And I've been thinking about that ever since because it really is. <laughs> it's really like they painted over the creation of Adam with like, I don't know, Funko Pop heads versions of God and Adam or something like that to make it more geek appropriate. But I do hope that that Ready Player 2 and Ready Player 3 and even Ready Player 4 have have a little bit more self-awareness in them um, because you have a capacity for bringing fun into the world that uh, that I think shouldn't go un untapped. So... We're rooting for you, but I think this is where we are going to call it a meeting. As always, I've been your host, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I've been I've been Joshua um, Ernest. I'm teaching a poetry course in the fall. If you want to enroll at St. Balasar University, um, hit me up. I'll give you the course number. It'll be a good time. I think we both could learn a lot from each other. <laughs> so take him up on that. Um, until then, please be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Spotify, wherever you happen to be listening to us or interacting with us. Uh, again, I say this every episode, but it's still so amazing to me how many people are reaching out and the interaction that we've been having, the time that you guys put into hanging out with us and, and learning about these books. Uh, I, I just can't get over how wonderful it is to see each and every one of you getting so involved so definitely you want to keep that momentum up and be sure to reach out with any suggestions or any feedback that you guys have you know we tell others to improve but we also want to improve ourselves no one is is perfect as a creator of anything absolutely so if you have any recommendations as far as books go as far as uh i don't know fun episode formats go send us an email um, I've already gotten a book actually from a listener that I am going to try to talk Andrew into reading on the show. I think it'll be a pretty fun one. Um, it's actually, it's sort of like a uh, handbook for mortals in that it has its own sort of like mythos surrounding it. That's pretty exciting. Uh, so that'll be a good one to look into. And, uh, you know, if you ever have any questions, like I said, last episode, send us some questions. I'd love to start doing like a mailbag segment on, I don't know, every episode, every other episode, something like that. Um, so hit us up. My avatar's level and hit point counters both had infinity symbols in front of them, and my credit readout now displayed a number 12 digits long. I was a multi-billionaire. I am entrusting the care of the Oasis to you now, Parzival, Halliday said. Your avatar is immortal and all-powerful. Whatever you want, all you have to do is wish for it. Pretty sweet, eh? He leaned toward me and lowered his voice. Do me a favor. Try and use your powers only for good, okay? Okay, I said in a voice that was barely a whisper. Halliday smiled then gestured around us. This is your castle now. I've coded this room so that only your avatar can enter it. I did this to assure, I did this to ensure that you alone have access to this.